faith. Because remember, the message of the book of Mark is repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. God's coming to establish his kingdom. Jesus is king. And it requires faith. He says, believe the gospel. Believe it and, and repent. And so when we look at the message of uh, the book of uh, Mark then and the idea of faith, we see there's a great importance of faith. Well, not just in this book, but just in the gospel. We know that uh, Hebrews eleven six says what? That's right. Without faith, it's? impossible to please God because everyone that must comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. So I just want to briefly just talk about faith because just like the word love, it's one of the most misunderstood words in the Christian world because, well, they, people just think, well, if I just believe that Jesus is the son of God, I'm going to heaven and that's, it ends right there. And they don't understand there's a lot more to the, uh, faith than just having mental assent. First thing I want you to notice, there's two uh, words that we use interchangeably. To believe is to have faith. Or if I have faith in Christ, I believe in Christ. And then, of course, the other word is uh, belief. Okay? They all come from the same word in the Greek. All right? Uh, it's this word pistis, all right, and pistos, and it, it, this has different forms. So you might think that, well, there's different Greek works for each of these. No, so one's a, a noun form, one's a verb form. If I believe, I have belief, right? Does that make sense? Or I have faith. And so they're all the same, and so when you see the different words, uh, whoever believes in him, it's using the same form of word here in the Greek. And so if we understand what it means, it's going to help us. It comes from this root, uh, pistis from this root meaning to be persuaded, pay fellow. And so it, what does that tell you about faith right from the beginning? If it comes from a root word that means to be persuaded or persuasion, what does that tell you about faith? Yes. Okay. Um, it has to be communicated by someone. That's one thing of it, but that's exactly has to be. Yes? All right. Then also, what about it? Is it just this blind leap where you just choose to have it? Or is it intellectual? It's, it's a matter of reason, it's a matter of conviction, it's not a feeling. It's not just this blind leap of faith that we hear people talk about. It's a product of persuasion that you're like, this is reasonable. And so that's what we have to understand. Now, a lot of people will uh, quote he Ephesians chapter 2 that faith, verse 8 and 9, is a gift of God. Well, the fact that we can have faith in Christ is only by God's grace. But does God give one person faith and not another? No, he doesn't. We know how faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. And that's all, again, by his grace that he made it available. But if faith is a product of persuasion, is there something we have to do to obtain faith? Well, absolutely. We have to do some thinking. And as Wayne pointed out, we have to do some listening to the evidence. And we need to do some pondering and some considering. And so when we talk about faith, there's three parts that we have to understand. And it's interesting because as we go through these uh, three incidents in the book of Mark, we're in Mark chapter 4, if you just got here, uh, we're going to ask which one of these is Jesus centering in on. The first part of faith is just this mental acknowledgement. You look at the evidence, you go, you know, it has to be true. Jesus has to be the Son of God. There's just no other conclusion. We call it mental ascent or being persuaded, accepting the facts is true. I believe that Jesus is the Christ. Now, does it stop there? No, we're going to see in chapter 5 that demons have mental assent. They acknowledge Jesus is the Son of God, but that's not going to help them at all. So this does not save, this faith does not save anyone in of itself. And that's what we have to understand. But 
a true saving faith will start in the head and then it takes over your life or your heart and your will. Will you start trusting him as the son of God that he cares and he's going to use his power and his person to help you. And when he says to do something, you can trust him. It's the right thing to do. We're going to see that demonstrated in the negative, first of all, when the, the sea incident, the rough sea, then we're going to see it in the positive uh, with a woman who has this uh, medical issue. All right. Did you have a hand up? That's right. There's, well, that's, and that's where it leads to the third thing. If you trust God and trust Christ, what are you always going to do? You're going to obey him. It, it only makes sense. because So this obedience is a matter of faith. It's not trying to work out your own salvation or earn it. It's saying, well, if he asks me to do this, that's what I'm going to do. Because it's an expression of your faith. If there is no action, there is no saving faith. James said what? Faith without works is dead. Now, uh, when we see uh, uh, some ten lepers, just one example real quick that, are in, uh, that Jesus encounters. What does he tell them to do? They plead for healing, right? What does he tell them to do? Go your, show yourself to the priest. You'd only show yourself to priests if you were what? Healed. healed. Are they healed yet? No. Like, why would you want us to go? We're just going to embarrass ourselves. But as they go, what happens? They get, they get healed. Was it because they trusted him or because they obeyed him? Obey. Both. <laughs> they trusted him enough to obey him. And as they're obeying him, it made no physical sense. But he, they were healed. Of course, only one turned back in gratitude. So that's what we see, these three things. So now with that understanding, uh, let's look at these incidents. First, it's going to be where Jesus calms the sea. And all these are, stories are interwoven with this message of faith. Because Jesus is trying to uh, emphasize the importance of faith. And so is the gospel writer here. So Mark chapter 4. In uh, verse um, 35 through 41. It's a great account. We read about it to our kids. It's very dramatic. And I want to emphasize it's also very true. And on that day, when evening had come, he said to them, Let's go to the other side. And leaving the multitudes, they took along with them, just as he was in the boat. And other boats were with him. And there rose a fierce gale of wind, and the waves were breaking over the boat so much the boat was already filling up. And he himself was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And being aroused, he rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Hush, be still. And the wind died down, and it became perfectly calm. Now, let's read, uh, talk about this, and then we'll look at the last two things. First of all, I just want you to notice some of the particulars, because this, this account is very detailed, and those details give evidence to its factual account, because the details are not necessary. And what do you mean? Well, first he says it's evening. Does that have anything to do with the, the story? Does that change it in any way that it's evening? Could it have been in the afternoon? Well, so why does he say it's in the evening? Because the person who's given the count, Mark, and is relaying it, he's telling you the facts. It was in the evening. And second of all, there were other boats. Now, that's interesting. How many were there? He doesn't say. Why does he mention other boats? Because there were other boats. Now, it's interesting. It wasn't just the 12, the witness of the calm in the sea, because they're on the sea. They're fearful for their lives. Their boats are sinking. And all of a sudden, immediately what? Poof. Goes flat. Do they know what happened? No, not until they get to shore, perhaps, and say, what happened? So, well, Jesus calmed the sea. Okay, And then it says he was asleep at the stern on a cushion. 
Now, why would he talk about a cushion? What does that have to do with the story at all? It's not necessary to demonstrate his power, but it's factual. That's a detail that you would give because they understand in that day they can discovered that on the stern, the guy that was like the helmsman who wasn't part of rowing, there was a cushion for him to sit on. So it's very factual, and the details show that it's true, and it's an account. Sort of like if you went to Seattle, say, yep, I was up at the Space Needle, and while I was there, why would you mention the Space Needle? To give context, and because it's there. Now, if you discovered uh, 200 years later uh, the, that writing, so there's no Space Needle, because it's been destroyed or whatever, then you do through some digging and archives, and say, oh, there's a picture, and there's the Space Needle. Then what would you think about that account? It must have been... Factual. I just want to share that with you, that these accounts are, are factual by the details that are given to it. Oh, before I leave that, um, there's a fierce gale. This word fierce really is the word mega. In the Greek, and we, meet, we use mega too, right? And mega means what? Huge. Now, they've seen storms on the Sea of Galilee. It's round, uh, surrounded with hills. And in the evening, the winds can come down, a north wind, and it can cause quite the waves and the storms on that sea, that, that lake. It's called a lake, a sea of Galilee, but it's really just a large lake, uh, five, six miles across. Uh, like our Great Lakes, you know, they have waves, right, that hit the shore. So just because it's a lake doesn't mean that it's small. It's really quite large. Now, they've been in these storms before because most of them are what? Fishermen. But this one was so bad, the boat's filling up with water because the waves are breaking over the boat and they can't bail fast enough. So what happens next? In this mega storm, Jesus, it's interesting, he's asleep. Now it tells us something about his humanity. What does it tell us? He's tired. He's tired. This is hard work, preaching and teaching and traveling. Even though he's God, he emptied himself, and he's in the form of a man just like you and I. He knows what it's like. What else does it tell you that he's asleep? He's not, concerned. not concerned a bit. Because he knows who he is, and he's not just the Lord of the Sabbath, which we read, but he's the Lord of nature and Lord of the winds, Lord of all creation. He knows that. Now, do the 12 faith in Jesus at this point. Say yes. And that's important you acknowledge that because they do believe because they're following him. And it's important because he's going to ask them a question. Why don't you have any faith? All right. So stay with me. Do they have faith? Yes. yes. All right. But do they understand who he is entirely? Yeah. It's not number one, mental assent. They're having a problem with trust issues. Yes. Yeah, that's right. So here's the question. They woke him. And the word literally means just like we would wake up. Wake up! You know, shaking someone. And when it says he got up, that word literally means when he woke up. Now, have you ever woken up for a nap and you're really groggy? And just like sometimes when you take a nap, well, when you get older, maybe that's what it is. You feel worse when you get up than when you went to bed. Is that true? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, sometimes that happens, right? Whatever, Jesus gets, he wakes up. He goes, what's the first thing that he does? Well, he talks to the sea, but then he talks to them. But here's the question that is, it, it, I don't know how to describe it. Well, we'll just ask it. What does he say? Teacher, do you not care? Do you not care? What's implied in that? How could you just sleep when we're all going to perish? Don't you care? Aren't you concerned about our peril? Why aren't you doing some at least bail with us? Don't you care? And on another level, it's just like to ask Jesus and accuse him of not caring, it's like, oh, ouch. But how many times when the storms of life hit us, 
who knows what it is. Some tragedy, some trauma, some death, loss of life, loss of relationship. We ask the question, God, don't you care? Why do you allow me to go through this? Well, that's always true. That's certainly. JC. That's interesting. I've never considered the timing because up to this point, they're probably doing their own part and they let him sleep. Is that what you're suggesting too? Yeah, but then when it gets overwhelming and they can't do anything, they finally wake him. Yeah, Terry. Yeah. Exactly. And so I don't know if we want to read too much into it. It's a rebuke. Like, why aren't you doing something? Why don't you care? But it sure sounds like that, doesn't it? It could be just, don't you care? What's wrong? With it? It, it, it's hard not to read some kind of mild rebuke into it, right? Yes, Kevin. It's hard to wake up for anything they say during that moment. Yes. Their yes. It's like, Go ahead. I wanted to, I think I skipped that. Did I skip that word? Oh, I think it's in the other account and the other account how they were fearful for their lives. Yes, exactly. It's hard to blame them. Yes. Go ahead. And I just said it's hard to trust what we're in the moment. I'm not saying we shouldn't, but it's hard. I think of the children of Israel when they were in Egyptian bondage and slavery for 400 years. Yes. And it says they were crying out the whole time. Yeah. Okay. It's easy to doubt and wonder. That's right. That's very true. Let's look at our three things now. First part of faith is mental. The second part, it moves to your heart. It's more... I was not just emotional, but it's volitional. It's something where you, you give yourself over to him. And then the third part is what? It's active, all right? So, um, and that's important we understand this because now when he gets up, he rebukes the wind. That's an interesting word. He rebukes the wind and the sea, both of them. You notice that? And so there's two words in the Greek, even though the English is be still, it's hush, still. So I don't know if one's for the wind and one's for the water. Must be, I don't know, but it's be quiet, be calm. And then the word wind died down. That's not really good for us in the, the, the English because that gives the, the sense that it just kind of went away. Slowly. But actually what it means, it just stopped. Now what do we have? A mega storm. And then it says it became perfectly calm. Guess what that word perfectly is in the Greek? Mega again. The writer uses on purpose mega waves and mega wind. And now it's mega what? Calm. I mean, like, have you ever been on the ocean where it's just almost flat? It looks like a lake. Not very often it happens that way. I mean, there's no waves. It's just like, wow, we could water ski on this thing. And you feel like you could walk on it because it's like glass. That's what they're seeing. This is perfectly calm from perfect storm. And the contrast is, is, is just 
Well, it, it's seen in the Greek, and that's what I'm trying to bro- bring it out to you. It's, 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 it's striking. And then he says to them, why are you afraid? Now, from our point of view, like Kevin said, <laughs> there's all the reason in the world, because we're going to die. Because they're looking at the physical, and they're forgetting about who's in the boat, right? He says, don't you have any faith? So which faith is he talking about? Do they have this? But do they have this? They're lacking. This is where they doubt. Because if you really have this, trust in Jesus because he's in the boat, you know nothing's going to happen to you no matter how badly the storm rages. Is that true? So that's why I ask him, he says, don't you have any faith? He's talking about trust. Don't you trust? After you've seen all the many miracles and the whole city's coming to my door and I'm healing them all and casting out demons, at this time, don't you trust me? And yet, that's all of us to some degree. We have lots of mental sin and we'll defend Jesus, but we get all anxious and worried and worked up and fearful and lose sleep, and it's because we don't believe Jesus is in our life. Or else we expect him to act like J.C. said right now. But sometimes he acts in his own time. Yes? Yes. That's a very good point. Now they become really afraid. First they was afraid of what? In their lives. Now the fear is directed to the right place. Not on the world around us. Not on its problems. But proper fear should be in Jesus Christ and Jehovah. Said, who is this man? Even the winds and the seas obey him. See, they're asking the question. It's starting here and it's going to move down to here. That's what we have to question. It's not... You know, what's this storm going to do? What's the political climate going to do? You know, what? No. Who is this man, Jesus? Yes, Josiah. The fact that them being afraid of him and the idea that he is our character. Yes. Struck me as they at this time might think that he went and healed Israel in the city of Israel. Yes. Yeah, could be. Everything we're all about is going to end right here. That could be as well. Guess what? Very much afraid. Guess what it is in the Greek? Mega fear. Mega storm, right? Mega calm. And now it's mega fear. They're terrified, not of the storm, but of this man who's in the boat with them. Not enough to run and leave. But to contemplate, who is this man? Yes. Is this, is, this is the first time this, this, this happened. It has happened a couple of times mm-hmm. on the sea and so forth. This is the first time it's a different miracle than they've seen before. They've seen healing and right? food and different things. And all those miracles, the, the, correct me if I'm wrong, or the most of them, the best of my memory, these were all, many of them were done by the prophets of old. Right. Not like this. Yeah. I mean, this is the power of creation where God yeah. spoke and Jesus was there and it was. I mean, uh, Joshua stopped the sun standing uh, still from moving, but yes, yes. And this is the first. And this is the first time it's probably directly affected them. Now, here's the point I wanted to make. How do you get to here? Trust. That's it. You got to go through the storm. Oh, I'd like to have trust. I have trust. No, if you don't go through the trials and the storms and the problems of life and then see how Christ delivers you, you're never going to develop trust. 
Until then, trust is just a mental concept. Oh, yeah, I trust him. Do you? Let's test it. Let's put you in a trial, in a storm, and let's see if you whine or complain. Let's see how you act. If there's calm and serenity, as you're trying to bail, but you're still okay, then we have trust. See, you don't develop trust until you go through the trust, the trial, the storm. And we want to skip the storm and go right to the trust, don't we? And that's why we need to embrace them if we really, truly believe Jesus in the, in the boat. You know, and so you have to go through the storm to get to it. So that's why when we obey Jesus, we're scared sometimes, but we do it anyway. We're just going to trust that he's going to take care of us, and we find out that he will. Yes, quickly. So that, that's like when Abraham was asked to sacrifice Isaac. Yeah. And after he succeeded, God said, now I know yeah. that you believe me. Believe. And that means trust me. Yeah. Good. All right. So any thoughts and more about that? So... If not, let's go to the next one. Now we're in chapter 5, and we're going to look at the uh, demonic person in the Gerasene area, and then we're going to look at uh, this woman with a hemorrhage, and then when we get back, Lord willing, next week we'll talk about Jairus' daughter, because they all are a story of faith, but we won't get to him till the end. But first of all, the, uh, this demon-possessed person in chapter 5. So verse 1, they came to the other side of the sea into the country of the Gerasenes. And when they come out of the boat, immediately, there's our word, right? That we see many, many, many times in the book. It's just this fast pace of the book of Mark. And immediately, a man from the tombs with an unclean spirit met him. And he'd been dwelling among the tombs, and no one was able to bind him anymore, even with the chain. Because he had been often bound with shackles and chains, the chains had been torn apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces, and no one was strong enough to subdue him. And constantly, night and day among the tombs and in the mountains, he was crying out and gashing himself with stones. And seeing Jesus from a distance, he ran up and bowed down before him. And crying out with a loud voice, he said, What do I have to do with you, Jesus? Son of the Most High God. That's a confession right there, isn't it? He says, I implore you by God, do not torment. For he had been saying to him, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. Now let's talk about this uh, so far and, and try to make some sense of it. Demon possession was a reality of its day. Wayne. Yes? But he didn't have faith in him. Well, and we'll make that point in just a second, but you're exactly right. He didn't have a, certainly a saving faith, but he had, well, which one did he have? One, two, or three? He has mental assent. He confesses Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, doesn't he? He has acknowledgement. Is that helping him in any at all? No. So uh, when we get here... Uh, we look at this guy, unclean spirit. Here in the Gerasene area is down here of Gadara. This is part of the Decapolis. They were six, ten cities. They were built for Herod or for the, the Caesar, and they paid homage to Rome. And so when you hear of the Decapolis, Deca means what? The ten cities. And we're down in this region right here that when this has taken place, okay? The southern part of the Sea of Galilee. Uh, and that's where this man is possessed with um, this demon. Now, demon possession was a reality in its day. And up until this time, there is no record of anyone ever casting out a demon. Period. Now, Jesus has been doing it from the beginning of his ministry. And he gives his apostles even the ability to do it. But this one's significant because... His name, is, his name is not Legion, but he is Legion because he has many multiple demons in, in the same time. We'll talk about that in a second. All right? Now, some people claim there's demon possession today, and that's going to be another study. There's no real indication it is because it's just like tongue speaking. If it's a real event today, you would expect to see it 
exactly the way you saw it in the New Testament times. Someone speaking Russian when they encounter a Russian. Someone speaking Chinese when they encounter a Chinese, even though they've never learned it. Demon possession, it, well, you tell me, what are some of the characteristics that mark this demon possession, this man? Reading through it. What are some of the characteristics of this man's demon possession? All right, first of all, great strength. It's breaking shackles and chains. How does that happen? And the answer is, I don't know, it's demon possession. Okay, what else do you see? Yes. Okay, that'd be the third one. It's self-destructive, isn't it? He's gashing himself. It's interesting, you give yourself to the world. There is evil in the world. It's self-destructive. And there's great power in allurement, but it's, it's going to take you down eventually. Yes, Gary? Because of so many things, so our heart is our people. Well, that's interesting. I didn't point, I didn't notice that. Okay, but there's something in between. I want to see who could get it. David? Okay. Yeah, he is an outcast, isn't he? There's something I want you to see. Read it. Look again. What? He's crying out. That's right. So there's torment, self-torment. I have it highlighted up there. There's, it's bolded, the word I'm looking for. We did gashing and screaming. Not able to bound them, him. What does that tell you? They tried, and they were successful. So it's progressive. You see that? Not anymore. They were able to. And when you sell yourself over the world, we're not talking about demon possession, but the same principles. Apply. There's great power in the world. There's great power in Satan, and he is alive today. And when you give yourself over to him, it's progressive. It, the evil that you get involved in gets worse and worse and worse demonstrably. And that's where the last one, it is destructive. You're crying out, you gash yourself, it's self-destructive. Those are some of the characteristics, and nobody else could do anything about it. No human is what I'm saying. And so here's the thing. It multiplies, and that's when he bows down before him. That's the word for worship. It comes from a word which means to kiss the ground. It's, it's used to when you bowed before king because you're paying homage to him. But here we have Satan's uh, soldiers bowing down before Jesus, paying homage. Very significant. And he goes, what business do we have to do with you? What's the answer to that? Here's Jesus in his ministry, and here's Satan in his ministry. What do they have to do with each other as far as partnership? Absolutely nothing. Nothing. Yes. Uh, what I like about this transition is you could not think that evil, uh, uh, fear demon possessed individuals, but with Christ, we get a total calmness in a change of life, a new life that is calm. And yes. Resting in him. In the world, we can never be satisfied. Yeah. That's true. And that's what's going to happen to this man. He's going to have the, the calmness that he wants, right? So the word implore means to, uh, to put him under oath. I, I implore you by God. In other words, swear to God you're not going to do me any harm. Now, that's, that's interesting. What's he doing to this man? Tormenting him. What's he asking and telling Jesus? You swear to me you're not going to what? Torment me. Like, What? Really? You dare ask that? That's Satan. He's so evil. He'll torment you and just rip you up one side and down the other. And But when it comes to him, he's a big baby and a big coward. Don't you torment me. For he had been saying, Jesus had come out of the man. Now that's interesting. Why didn't it happen the first time? Uh, there's no answer given to us. James 2, this is what Wayne was saying. James says, the angels even believe and tremble. Does this guy have faith? Yeah, there's a confession. Jesus, the son of the most high God. He has, number one, doesn't he? 
But it's not connected with any repentance or willingness to submit and obey. And that's why James is mocking the people in the world. He says, you fools, don't you realize faith without works is dead? And the idea that you can claim, I believe, well, you're no different than the demons. That's pretty strong language, isn't it? Yes. Yes. All indication was it was an involuntary invasion <laughs> by these demons that occupied him. He had nothing to do with it. Yes. All right. And that's why it was so tormenting. All right. So here we uh, uh, see then what happens. Jesus uh, asked him, what is your name? There was a superstition in their day that if you could name the demon, then you could cast him out. If you didn't know his name and couldn't call him out by name, you couldn't cast him out. Jesus doesn't play into that because he says, what is your name? He said, my name is Legion, for we are many. Now, if that's actually his name, some people say, is he just describing himself or actually giving his name? But Legion means what? It's a, a division of Roman army numbering about 6,000 plus uh, additional cavalry. Some say as high as 6,800 people. And so I'm not suggesting that he's saying there's 6,000 demons in this man, but there are what? Many. How many are many? Legion. We're legion. Now, it's, it's an amazing feat what's going on here. It's going to happen. And he began to implore him. Again, that's by God. Take an oath. Don't send us out of this country. And so we see then what happens. There was a large herd of swine feeding nearby in the mountains. And the demons, again, begging him now. Send us into the swine so we may enter them. And Jesus gave them permission. Who's in charge? Could they enter those pigs without his permission? He's in charge, and they recognize it. Yes, quickly. Yes. That's right. That's right. His power. That's right. So they all come out, maybe all 6,000 of them. They enter the swine, and there's about 2,000 of them. And what immediately happens to them? Like a bunch of lemmings, they run over the cliff into the sea and perish. And that's an amazing sight because the herdsmen are watching. It's like, what happened to the pigs? What's, look at it. It's, it's, they've never seen anything like it. They've gone crazy. They've gone mad. Now they're upset because of the loss of income. Question, why are they hurting pigs in the first place? Because they're unclean animals. So either these are not Jews, they're sometimes Samaritan people, or they're just outcast, rebellious Jews. Don't know for sure. So when they find out about it, they report in the city, the country, and the people came to see what had happened. So all the dead pigs are down at the bottom or floating in the water. They came to Jesus and observed the man who had been demon-possessed sitting in, down in his right mind and clothed. Are they impressed with that? They acknowledge it. They see it. Do they have this? Perhaps. But they beg him because they're frightened. And they beg him to do what? To leave. Now, I cannot wrap my mind around this, even though I've, I've, I've looked at uh, try, uh, different explanations, but it's true in the world. Some people will encounter Jesus, but they're more scared of the change that he's going to make in their life than what he will offer them, and so they want him to leave. And it's not because they don't know, but they don't want to trust and obey him. Is that not true? Is with Lazarus, they knew, they recognized a miracle had been done. They wanted to kill Lazarus and Jesus. And it's just, I don't understand that phenomenon, but yet it happens in my family and people close to me. They know, but they're more scared about the change they'll have to make than they are of Jesus. 
So they beg him to go. In the meanwhile, he gets in the boat. All right, I'm leaving. If you don't want me, that's fine. I'm out of here. Who comes up to him? The formerly demon-possessed person. What does he do? He begs as well. One group is begging, get out of here. And he's begging, take me with you. Take me with you. Let me go with you. I've got a great story to tell. I'm so grateful. Right? Has his, this guy's moved way past mental. He's in trust and now he's in obey. Right? So what did Jesus say? Uh-uh. No. Not everyone that wants to go with Jesus can go with Jesus. But that doesn't mean he doesn't have something for him to do. You see that? It says, no, he did not let him. He permitted the demons to go in the swine, but he's not going to permit this man to follow him physically with the 12. He said, here's what I want you to do. You go back to your people. You go back to your town and you report to them the great things that God has done for you and how he's had mercy on you. Is he uniquely qualified to talk about the greatness and majesty and the mercy of God more than anyone else? Oh, yeah, because he's a changed man. They all knew who he was. He probably still has the scars all over his body. And he has a powerful message to share, and that's exactly what he does. He went away, began proclaiming in all Decapolis, the ten cities, that whole area. And proclaim what great things that Jesus has done for him. And people are mesmerized. They're in awe. Like, who is this man named Jesus? Maybe that's why Christianity doesn't grow like it should. It's because, one, we haven't allowed Jesus to do great things in our life. Because we're not willing to trust him so much we'll obey him to let him do those things. And second of all, we don't go out and describe it. He's done great things for all of us. And all he wants us to do is share that message with others who are willing to listen. So they'll be amazed as well. It's just that simple. I can't have you all following me. I need some of you out there sharing it. Isn't that what he's saying? And he's very effective in it. Yes, Dave. Yeah. Only he can share That's right. Of the impact and the grace of God and what yeah, he's uniquely qualified. And it's not what he wants to do, it's what God's going to ask him to do. Now, we're out of time, but I'll just set this one and we'll look at it next week. Darius is a synagogue official. He's another state man of faith because he's the one that organized and set up the synagogue and the worship, a very important religious leader. Not like Nicodemus who came by night, he comes in the middle of the day. Why? What, what's his motivation to come to Jesus, the healer? Faith. Yes, but what is motivating him to act on his faith? When you have trauma and, and tragedy in your life, your daughter's dying, I don't care what people think of me anymore. I don't care if I'm seen. I'm going to Jesus, and I'm going to ask for help. And he begs him, please come. Now, while he's going... We have this interruption because a woman, <laughs> she has the same kind of faith. We'll talk, talk about it. And while he's, she's being healed, his daughter dies. And that sets up next week's account of these stories of faith. All right, thank you very much.